Hey, welcome to Joey's Helping Others. Uh, today I have a returning guest. This yes. is Jonathan Guajardo. He is the first person I ever interviewed for my podcast, Helping Others. And um, we're circling back because a lot has changed since I last talked to you. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, well, we've gone through a lot of changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I started this uh, podcast, I was a lecturer professor at Texas A&M, which I am no longer. I am mm -hmm. now an associate professor of the practice and um, now Johnny is a lecturer at Texas A&M. Uh, we were able to hire him and pick him up to teach uh, some public speaking courses, a, uh, some new media courses, technology and skills. Mm -hmm. And then you have been proposing some courses yourself and also taking on some, some courses as requested, such as social media. Yeah, definitely. Uh, was, I mean, I, I think the last time we, we did the interview, uh, it was over at Dreaminoids, and you know, circumstances were very different back then. But yeah, now I'm now I'm at A and M, uh, and I teach, like Joy said, a, a lot of comm courses, you know, and a lot of uh, uh, new media courses. And then I, I proposed uh, new media entrepreneurship uh, last uh, semester, and uh, now I'm teaching it for uh, the fall and the spring, and then it's looking to become a 300 level course after this. Yeah, I mean they. <clears throat> It went from like an idea you had to a course that was made to one of our colleagues, Nancy Street, who's the uh, undergraduate coordinator, uh, kind of really took it and ran with it and yeah, yeah, it was put a, it into it, the curriculum. Yeah, it was great. Um, I, I think I proposed it in the beginning of spring, and, uh, and, and she was like, whoa, this is great. Like, let's definitely talk some more about this. Like, I, I, I want to see where this goes, you know. And so I put forth a syllabus uh, to her. And she, and she looked it over and was like, I was like, wow, this is, this is looking really good, you know. And she proposed a few changes to make to it and stuff. And then it's, it went up through the ladder and uh, got approved as a 49, which is like a provisional course. Um, and so that's how it is for fall and spring. And then it's looking to become a, a full-fledged course, a 300-level course. 377 will, should be the course number. Yeah. Uh, and it, it'll, it'll be that in the um, in, uh, next school year so so yeah and that'll be a uh like a junior level course that's cool yeah so um johnny and i uh johnny started teaching last fall so um <clears throat> we started teaching our classes together uh i took on some public speaking i had never taught that before they had asked him to teach public speaking and then um, we taught uh it's called a com 230 which is technology and skills and then a com 250 new media course and we also have a colleague uh, who's not here with us today because yeah. uh, obviously you're on the the the, uh, the podcast. But I'd love to have all three of us on actually with Jaffe. Mm, Jaffe would be cool to have on. Yeah, uh, Jaffe Song is uh, an amazing colleague of ours who uh, has been in cahoots with us <laughs> as we develop our program because um, we have not been given any official program to develop. But uh, just like when I was at UIW and just like when uh, I went to uh, UT Austin, I just always was like, we just make something and it'll happen. And so uh, with with uh, uh, UT, I was in the ACT Lab and um, I had a great colleague named Brandon Wiley and, uh, you know, great uh, uh, mentor Sandy Stone. And she just facilitated uh, randomness for us. And so when I went to UIW, that's what I did there. And Johnny and Christian Rios and a bunch of other students, uh, and I mean, go on and on, Chris yeah. Peter and Andrew Valdez and Miriam and uh, uh, Thomas and Aaliyah Jean and um, just a slew, Stephanie Sanchez. Like there's just a, yeah. a slew of a whole bunch of students, yeah, students that can yeah, Sarah, Marie Sarah Gannon, Gannon, like yeah. just all these different people went off to go do really great things. Charlie Young, we won't mm -hmm. forget Charlie. Definitely Charlie. Shout out uh, to Charlie. Uh, you know, just it goes on and on and on. And we just forgot like everybody. So uh, we apologize. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so when we got here, when, jo when Johnny came on board, I had already started having some meetups, but um, I hadn't gotten to have uh, kind of like a... Uh, uh, a rolling meetup where we're meeting up every week or every other week. And so Johnny came in last fall and we started hosting meetups and Jaffe uh, became participatory in them. And by the end of the fall, I mean, we were taking students uh, off campus to 
go and learn photography, go learn some cinematography. I mean, it was, it was really brewing. And then going into uh, the spring, you know, we were at the point where we were having meetings every week because the students wanted them. And oh, yeah. We started with, stu- you know, maybe like three to five students a meeting. We were up to about 15 to 20, depending on the, on the week. Uh, and we had set it up so that students were coming, um, like one week would be on a Wednesday, another week would be like on a Tuesday or a Thursday. I yeah, can't remember. Yeah, it would be something like that. Yeah. yeah we'd just, like stagger them. We'd stagger them so that if, it, if you had a class during that time, you could make it. So, um, so we ended up starting to build some community and we've continued to do that. We've been having meetups throughout the summer on Zoom. And, uh, I mean, we did go on hiatus for about three months. Well, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> I think a lot of people... Rightly went, so, rightly so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people went on hiatus. For a little while. And um, and so, uh, so, yeah, so that was kind of like how we started building up our community here. And, uh, and so this year, we're making a real big push to build community again um, and taking the lens of, you know, social distancing and COVID into consideration, which has been, I mean, it, to be honest, it's been a challenge. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, especially at first, like getting into that, you know? Yeah. And, and then um, I think now people are getting more used to the Zoom format. And so that's only helping us out because, I mean, we've been doing a few meetups on Zoom. You know, we've been having conver- uh, a convergent media collective meetups, you know, uh, on Zoom, of course. And, and even uh, meeting with graduate students for our, our talk series on Zoom. And I feel like that's been going well. Do you want to talk about the talk series a little bit? Yeah, well, you mentioned it. So yeah, why, yeah. Don't you, why don't you pitch it to me, even though I pitched it to you? All right, so we're doing this talk sh- uh, series called Showing Trajectory, which is uh, it's supposed to kind of show students, um, not people who have, com- who have completed and who are at the end of their career, but people who are currently going through or you know, progressing through uh, their career, and you can see the path going forward. You can see that, that at, at some point in the future, this is going to go somewhere. This is going to be somewhere, right? And they're currently um, on that path right now. So, and th- I mean, the, the reason I, you've used this term is showing trajectory a lot, you know, and, and the reason it's so important is because sometimes it, it, it's, it's important not just to see the Steve Jobs or, to, or, or the, uh, you know, the, the Bill Gates or the people who have, who have gotten to the top of where they are, right? But the people who are in the process of climbing that mountain and overcoming these obstacles. And that's oftentimes even more inspirational to see. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely one of those uh, ideas where I wanted to um, take what we had done with our Convergent Media Lecture Series at, in San Antonio, which we hosted beyond uh, just being at, at um, UIW. I mean, it kept going. And what we would do is invite people that are uh, in the process of developing themselves professionally. And instead of talking about just what they do, they would talk about how they got into what they're doing, um, the challenges that they face, and um, how they saw themselves going about creating a career or an artistic uh, 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 space for themselves. Because, you know, it's very, very tough for people to um, kind of see that, especially when you're in college. It, you're taking these classes, they're telling you to be creative, um, uh, hopefully. Not all the time. <laughs> At least from what I found, they they, yeah. uh, they sometimes don't do that. But um, but they're not telling you how you're going to get a job. They're not telling you uh, how like who to look towards to even finding jobs and finding mentorship. Uh, one of the things that I've always been a big proponent of is uh, having mentors and having reciprocal mentoring relationships, meaning that I'm not always looking just for someone older to mentor me, but I'm looking for someone that is more naive than I am about uh, what I do to inform me about how, even though I may be an expert in something, I may not explain it in a way that's accessible to the next generation. And, uh, and so I get a lot of reflexivity when I get to kind of have those relationships. So the idea behind this lecture series isn't just finding the best at what they do, which often they are. Uh, it's finding people that have a genuine ability to, uh, exude that enthusiasm to people that are ahead in the journey and behind in the journey of uh, the field that they're trying to get into. Yeah, definitely. And so that's what we've been working on right now. And that's been really fun. Uh, 
to work with the grad students on, and and uh, I think we have Anthony and Valentina and Marco. Shout yeah. outs. Yeah, you yeah. Know, have to give the shout outs where the shout outs are due. Yeah, and uh, and so it's you know it's been really great kind of working through this process of um, seeing a n- literally a new generation. One of the things Johnny and I realized uh, this past weekend is I explained to Johnny, I was like, Johnny, you realize you're now at the age that I met you at. So you're 29 and I met you mm-hmm. when I was 29 and you were 19 and I'm 39 and you're 29 now. <laughs> and so the undergrads that you're teaching, like, you know, are like what you were to me. And uh, jo- I kind of hit Johnny. And, and I was like, wait a second, hang on a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was 19. Yeah, I think that was when we first right, met. 18, yeah. 19 years old, something like that. 2010, 2009. Yeah, 2010. Like and, uh, mm-hmm. and so it was, it's one of those things where, um, w- now Johnny has a lot to learn about this next generation, whether, uh, cause you know, we talked about being digital natives, uh, we yeah. talk about being di- digital natives a lot, but this next generation, 10 years after Johnny, uh, are true digital natives. They, they grew up in 2000 and beyond, mm-hmm. uh, they were, you know, 10 years old between, uh, 2008 and 2012. And, uh, and so these students that are coming in now, um, have not grown up without the internet for the most part. I mean, very unlikely. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, in many ways they, they kind of transcend the term digital native, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, the iPhone like, was out when yeah, they were a kid. Yeah. And, and, and many of them like grew up with nothing but touchscreen technology, right. whereas we're digital natives, but we went through, I mean... I mean, especially you, but also me, you know, like we went through periods of the flip phone and like, you know, right. uh, uh, Nokia's modems, and stuff like yeah. that and modems and dial, yeah, dial up and all that broadband. Yeah. Hearing that, that, uh, that, that terrible sound sometimes, yeah, which yeah. I actually kind of like, I think it's kind of, yeah. You know, my mom's always like, telling me, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually from uh, Ninjago, the movie <laughs> and Jay's talking, <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, um, I guess my, my point is, is that, uh, as we've been teaching the past year, we've also like seriously been reflecting on our pedagogical approach to how we engage students, how we engage each other as colleagues, uh, and of course our peers, and um, what it means in terms of like technological impact and versus uh, pure uh, theoretical approaches and uh, professional approaches. So kind of what, you know, how does uh, technology mediate that space and uh, how does society mediate technology um, in this time? And then, of course, you know, a little more than halfway through this uh, journey, COVID happened and -hmm. and we really, as a society, started taking technology into a very, very serious level. Yeah. Um, It it crept into everybody's lives. And at this point... um, it's almost abnormal to see us like sitting next Close to, each, to other. each other. Yeah. Like this, yeah, because uh, we actually co- uh, are f- having coviding together and, and That's uh, a term now, COVID. yeah, I guess it actually, yeah, is. <laughs> I think yeah, I think it is. It I don't should know. be. <laughs> and so we, uh, we, we, um, social distance together. So we hang out and collaborate all the time. Uh, I think mainly because of the fact that like, there's, we don't, you know, you can't just go and collaborate with, with anybody else. No. Yeah. Just because you need like a two week spread and you need testing and you need a bunch of other things to be really safe about it. So we're in the bubble, so yeah, to speak. I guess we have like our bubble. <laughs> Extended bubble. Yeah. And uh, and so what that's allowed us to do is to kind of uh, take on a lot of different projects that we weren't um, maybe having time for before. Yeah. You know, uh, I think one of the things that this has really you know shown us is that, I mean, we are in this transitional space where things can be taken online, you know, and, and, and uh, even in many ways, our teaching, although at first we were very much like, ah, I don't know, you know, is it going to be, is, is, the, is the pedagogy, you know, is our, is our teaching methods, are those going to carry over, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I know we were thinking about that at first, but I mean, this has definitely shown that you definitely can have, have an extended pedagogical approach, you know, through, through digital means and can kind of craft that relationship with your students. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, I, we, uh, we do all project-based learning. We don't have any tests. We don't have any quizzes in our core courses that we have control over. Um, you know, some of the courses that we teach for our department, we have uh, some tests and some quizzes. But for the most part, you know, that's that's what we strive for and that's what we push. 
and taking it online felt like it could become very artificial yeah, and like very mediated it's very, very quickly. Yeah, because I felt like, well, where is the intangibles going to be taught? How do we create sincerity? How do we have uh, a course that has uh, a community and a cohort built into it? And so, um, you know, we we actively thought about that and we shared that, you know, yeah. with our with our students in the spring. You know, we talked to them about it and we went back and forth and we talked to our colleagues about it Um because I knew that this is different than just doing like being an online institution. This is something that's very different because people are going through th- things uh, from a mental health and a, and a physical health space that is unprecedented. Yeah. You know, uh, and I think like you mentioned there, one of the interesting things we did was we talked to our students about it. And we're like, look, this is new for us. This is new for you. And, um, you know, because all of our courses are project based and, you know, um, going through UIW and, and your program. I was, you know, I went through that project-based learning, and so I really became indoctrinated with that, right? And that's something that I've really internalized and is very important to me, uh, and I've, I've seen it work, is, is project-based learning. But um, having that dialogue with the students, that's something that, that I feel kind of strengthens our perspective and our, and our point of view because when we first went online, I mean, the students, they had their own, like, like concerns about everything, and they still do, you know? But I think being able to uh, to address those concerns and and address them in a way where it seems like you know we're not coming down on them you know if they if they're not I guess meeting uh, the expectations right now or you know uh, if they're kind of working outside of that uh, it is is a different approach that we do where it's kind of like yeah I mean I know you're going through a tough time this is unprecedented you know for uh, for all of us so kind of navigating that together and explaining to them how we're also going through this transition is, you know, and we're in it together and having that dialogue, that was something that, that uh, has always been very important to me with the dialogical, uh, you know, sort of education model that, that I think I talked about in, in the last podcast with um, my research in a John Andrew Rice and Black Mountain College, you know, one of the things he talked about was um, when, when he was teaching, if something bothered him or, or if a certain reading rubbed him a certain way or, you know, uh, if he wasn't feeling good that day, even something like that, he would tell the students and not try to put up a facade between them because that only creates a, a more of a barrier uh, in the teaching environment. Yeah, I mean, and that was, um, like, for example, just today, like, I literally, uh, for both of my courses that I've taught so far, I teach one more, um, I uh, I stopped about 20 minutes early and just said, hey, look, like, I want to talk to you all about something. It has nothing to do with class. It just has to do with kind of where we're at in time. And I said, I noticed that in all of my classes, people are are signing in later. Uh, People aren't showing up as much uh, with their cameras on. And, um, you know, I really don't have a problem with that. I'm seeing it across all of my classes. So what this is telling me is that we're hitting like a second wave. We're hitting a second a second space for this semester. The fir- I, I felt like the first part of this semester was everybody kind of was like, we're going to get through this. We're going to mm-hmm. do this. I'm going to be engaged. I'm going to um, get through this process. And now we're kind of at that, that lull. Um, a student recommended me this podcast to listen to. Uh, and I honestly can't remember her name, but I listened to it. And um, she's a, a, a psychologist, I believe. And the, the podcast that was recommended was called The Second Day. It's like, you know, you have your first day where uh, everything starts and you're going to go get it. But the second day is that time where it's like, OK, now we got to do the work. Now we've got to do this. And um, and it's I think in, in the pressure cooker of covid, um, I think it's definitely uh, uh, that second day has been tough for a lot of people. Uh, I think it's you're waking up. And there's a little bit of monotony built in. Um, there's a little, it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to become more and more disconnected from uh, what you're doing because the me- it's, it's so mediated in terms of uh, a, a social and cultural practice. I mean, we're literally in our own spaces physically and we're not coming into close contact. And so you may have some serious uh, uh, enthusiasm coming in, but it's just, it's wearing on some people. You know, um, so I teach two classes in person this semester and then three online. Uh, And the two that I teach in person, 
you know, so uh, uh, the students don't have to physically be in the classroom if they don't want to be. That's the interesting thing about the in-person class is that they don't have to actually be in the classroom. Uh, they can be on Zoom if they don't feel comfortable being, being in person. Uh, and, and then, so I would say, I guess roughly the first few days I taught um, the in-person classes, I think I had like maybe half of the class in person, right? Um, and then after, I mean, at, at least for because I had like a hundred, I have a hundred person class. So I guess like half of that was like in person. And then after that, it kind of began waning. And, you know, one of the things I told them the first day, I'm, I'm like, look, you know, if you don't feel comfortable being here, you don't have to be, you know, I'm not going to take off points if you're on zoom and, and it, you know, I, 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 because you have to feel comfortable in order to have a good learning environment to, to be, to really, to really, you know, work on your, on, on your material and, and learn and expand your mind. And so uh, well, what's interesting is that when, we, when I do the half online, half in person, I'll notice interaction between the online and the in-person sometimes back and forth. But for the most part, they're kind of sticking to their own little areas. And so when I kind of merge that and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do, all right, today we're going to do synchronous online fully, right? Some days I'll do that and they'll do it fully online. And the discussions are just so much more like amicable. Like it, uh, it, everyone's just equitable. Uh, yeah. equitable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I mean, everyone's more willing to share. And, I, and I've noticed that if I go from a class that is, for the most part, in person, and I go online, there are more of the screens flipped on and people are engaging because you have the students who are there in person who are going to flip on their screen either way because they made the effort to like come to class and, and, and have that going. And, the, and then you have the ones who are always online and they're wanting to interact with, with their peers who they don't see. Um, you know, when they're in person. So I think it's, I think it's very interesting how we're kind of bridging this, like we're in a hybrid model right now. It's not fully online. It's not fully in person. Yeah. And, and uh, so, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I asked them, I asked them what their challenges have been, what's been, what's worked for them. A lot of them really like the fact that um, they can still go to class and not fall behind uh, if they have to go home for a family emergency or something like that instead of emailing and saying, hey, I can't make it to class. What did I miss? They're able to still show up to class, see their family, take care of an issue, and then come back and have uh, 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 less of a gap in terms of, of, of what they have to catch up on. So I found that really interesting. Some of their frustrations, a, a lot of them, not a lot, but like a, 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 a number of people did mention that it's really hard to take uh, um, uh, language courses. Oh, yeah, I can online. see that. Um, and then some of them were talking about how it's hard to do a language course that's hybrid, you know? Mm. So uh, if they're teaching in person and on Zoom at the same time, it's just, it became a little overwhelming. But, uh, but yeah, so kind of, you know, having that discussion, I ended up having a lot of students say thanks for, like, bringing this up and, and kind of creating room. But, you know, I told them, I said, you know, the reason this is important to me is... Uh, kind of weird in that I am you know I'm kind of a capitalist <laughs> you know I'm someone that uh it's like if you're spending money with me which I see these students as spending money with me they're paying uh their tuition and I'm here providing a service uh they need to be getting a good experience and they need to get a good ROI return on investment and uh, that only benefits me and benefits them you know if they're having a great experience and they're able to get the tools they need to go get a job after they graduate, uh, they're going to speak highly of the program and more people are going to come. You know, if I make it more and more difficult for them to be able to engage and learn the material, well, uh, they're not going to be able to get the jobs that they should be able to get and they're not going to recommend uh, this uh, this program to other people. Yeah, and, and I think it's something that's, that's pretty unique. Uh, I mean, and in terms of, we're thinking about, and I know that, uh, I think we talked about uh, a bit about this the other day. Is like we went through the uh, the um, I mean, when I went through the program at, at UIW, it was a communication arts program, right? Mm -hmm. So it was more uh, geared towards practical knowledge, right? So I guess like running a new studio or, or operating uh, operating cameras or you know or e uh, editing on a certain piece of software, right? So you would you would do all this this almost technical training, yeah. And so that's one of the things that we did at UIW. And then uh, coming here, where, where there's more of a theoretical grounding, and and where teaching is more theoretical based, but we're also, I mean, you and I, uh, especially, are are trying to incorporate, you know, some practical skills, some practical knowledge, but but, but more in terms of knowing that they're out there, you know, and, yeah. and, and knowing that these are skills that th they can have, and they may not know everything about them, 
because we're not a technical college, right? But they may not know everything about them, but they know they they have a very well-rounded worldview of all of all these different types of technologies and how they can utilize them. Because ultimately, once they graduate, like that's their goal, right? They want to get a job, and they want to go work somewhere. And so uh, I feel like we're kind of in the space um, of preparing them to do that, right? And recognizing that that's why they're here, and recognizing that. They're here because they want to go get a job afterwards. But what, what does that mean? What's the, what's the job market even going to look like? What's the industry even going to look like upon graduation? I mean, I'm doing uh, jobs for ESPN San Antonio right now, right. and we moved our, our, our full studio. It's, it's, now on, it's now on Zoom, and we're, we're broadcasting on Zoom uh, every Thursday night from 7 on Texas Golf Insider, facebook.com forward slash Texas Golf Insider, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we're, uh, we're doing all of our, our shows on there now, right? And so even just entering that space, and I mean, the, one of the things I always tell my students is not to think about what the job market looks like right now, what job you want to get at this given moment, but what are the jobs going to be like years from now, uh, and, and how are those jobs going to shift technologically and, and culturally, and, and what, are, so what are the social ramifications of that going to be? And I know that that's something that's very important to you also uh, when talking to your students about that is figuring out not, not only where, where we are currently, but what the future is going to be like. And that's something that I've always liked that, that um, you know, we try to emphasize to our students. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, it's just something very serious to me because like I tell my students, I'm, I'm like, you're paying thousands and thousands. I, I just don't know of any other thing in life where people just throw, I don't want to say money down the drain, but um, they really don't understand all the money they're, they're putting into this, yeah. you know, and the time that it's, I mean, it's a, to me, it's a very foreign idea looking back now that I just was like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, in my case, it was about $20,000 a year. I'm going to take $20,000 a year. It was like 16 to 20. Um, and I didn't think of it as like one, two, three, putting the dollars down, putting 20, you know, 16,000 or 20,000 dollars down. I was just signing my financial aid, getting my student loan packages because my parents had four kids in school. And so even though that was tough, they didn't make enough money and they hadn't saved enough money to uh, send me to college. So I took out all these student loans. I got $150,000 student uh, 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 debt. And, um, and I'm thinking about the students that are going through this. I'm thinking about their parents. You know, I'm wondering, you know, does the middle, does middle class America have the ability to weather these charges that we're putting on to this, this proverbial credit card? And, um, and I want to bring that to my students' attention. I want them to understand the investment that they're making, the money that they're spending and what they're supposed to be getting out of this. And, um, I also like, I guess what's all, what's different about, I feel like what's different about me is that usually what you're saying uh, as an adult when you're saying that is that you need them to work hard, pay attention, and do what we ask you to do, and that's how you're going to be successful. You know, very kind of uh, dictatorial, or dic- I don't know if that's a word. Dictatorial? But dictatorial. Something I don't like know, that. Something yeah, like yeah. that. Like a dictator. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like a dictator. Very much like, if you do what I say, you're going to be successful. Well, the answer is, I did exactly what everybody told me to do, and I wasn't financially successful. Yeah. You know, I went and got an education. I went and did this. I went, I'm, I'm like, I'm still $200,000 in debt uh, with with everything all said and done, cars and all that stuff. And, uh, and I didn't learn how to do practical things. College didn't teach me how to go and get a job. College didn't teach me, uh, the intangibles that I needed in order to be successful in even my field, you know, uh, of, of academia, because what, 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 what college didn't know when it was teaching me was that it was teaching too many of me's, <laughs> right? It was teaching too many PhDs and, and the market was was closing down and it's saturated now. And now if you go and get a PhD, I mean, I highly caution you to look at what the employment numbers look like. You know, Johnny and I, we love what we do. Oh, yeah. I mean, we love it. We, we don't we we revel in every day that we get to get up and do this. And uh, not everybody does like not everybody that has a job like us do. But a lot of it is because we know that there are 10 people behind us that would love our job 
like love it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I pay aside. It's not like we're, we get paid all this money. That's not what I'm saying. It's that like, there are tons of people that are highly educated that aren't finding jobs. And so, um, you know, that's what our, the goal of our, our education pedagogical approach is, is that we want to create students that are savvy when it comes to understanding uh, real world issues of, of employment that are savvy of uh, the theoretical models that they're navigating through in terms of our field that we're in, but even beyond uh, in terms of just social and cultural practices in general. And then we're also, um, you know, we're looking for a way to build a genuine community. Yeah. And, uh, you know, community is something that I felt like uh, you've always emphasized and that that's something that we had when we were uh, at UIW, of course. I, I remember after every class, you know, we, we would have night classes. So I go from like seven to like nine or something, right? And afterwards, we'd go eat at the infamous gyms, yeah. you know, and, and, or, so, or wherever else in San Antonio. And we'd create this little community. And what was nice about that was that, you know, a, 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 especially at, at, a, at a smaller university where you're having all these night classes, and sometimes it's very easy to feel disconnected, you know. Uh, we were having, and it was a primarily commuter campus, too. Uh, where it's easy to feel disconnected. I know uh, for the first few years that I was at, or I guess the first few, I guess months, and, and, and until I met you, really, in Christian, uh, that I was at, at UIW, I did feel disconnected um, because, so, because like, it was kind of ingrained in the culture. You'd go to school, then you'd go home, and that was it, right? Um, but building that community and then kind of showing, you know, uh, through that community and, and people who we would, you know, who would meet outside, outside of our extended I guess, you know, our extended uh, school community like K. Cruz and other professionals who were in the yeah, industry. Mary Lenu Gers, yeah. And definitely Mary uh, Lenu Gers as well, you know, and, and, a, and a score of others, Jason uh, Torres and everyone yeah. else, you know. Like, uh, this, this showed us that there is, you know, there are avenues to be taken, right? Because I think when I first came to UIW, and, you know, I had kind of, a, I mean, we're talking about, I guess, how we got into school and all that stuff. Well, uh, I was originally going to go to a and you know, and I got into a and and I still get alumni mail from them because I think I graduated in 2013. Nice. Uh, but, um, but, uh, which by the way, I don't mind at all. I'll totally give some money back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I was going to go to a and and it was going to be for architecture because I come from a family of architects. But then, um, you know, I, I had applied to UIW kind of loosely, you know, and I was like, well, there's this media thing I'm interested in. I shot, I shot video for the football team. Uh, in high school, and I was just really big into like you know I, I liked the film and video, and so one of the things that um that really kind of shipped me was I was, I was at A and M. I did all the orientation. And I loved it. I was super excited about coming here, and then UIW offered me a, like basically a full scholarship to, get, to go back to San Antonio, and and be, and enroll at UIW, and I think they started a week after A and M or something like that, and so I went back. You know I was like I was like you know I'd rather graduate with with no debt and be able to have the freedom to, to kind of do what I want to do, then uh, especially because I didn't know what the avenues in the communication field were. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, fu- it's a, uh, a, it's a fun space, but it, it's an expensive one until yeah. it's not expensive anymore, meaning um, totally different story. But, you know, I started off mechanical engineering and then I walked over, uh, I walked out of the, uh, orientation and walked over to to radio television film and it, it was like it was like the most fun looking thing ever but i also saw like the worth of my degree like kind of plummeting and i even knew that then and so i was like man i'm gonna have to really figure this out i'm gonna have to figure out how i make money and uh and so i i uh you know i was fortunate and that i found the act lab and found the program that i ultimately ended up going through but that but that program was not the way it was the exception you know and what's when we were at UIW, you know, um, the convergent media program was the exception. It wasn't the way. Uh, we had a lot of people that just didn't like the way it was being done. Uh, they thought we were too, I don't know. Loosey-goosey, I yeah, guess. Yeah, too loosey-goosey. <laughs> For lack of a better term, yeah. laissez-faire. I don't but, know. But what's, and I, I think, honestly, I think academia just has caught up. And so now we're at A&M, of all places, uh, and I mean that in a very, <laughs> like, uh, uh, entangled way of all places, uh, is loving what we're doing. And instead of like challenging it from a, an ivory tower space is saying, Hey, we have our approaches and we're excited to have your approaches. 
and uh, let's do this in unison and see what the students can get out of this. Yeah. And see what kind of students we can create by having them do some good theory, some good writing, and also uh, start learning some some practical skills. And I think what's what kind of also opened it up for them, I, I like to think, I don't know, maybe we're giving ourselves too much credit, is that, um, you know, we do have this pedagogical model. We do have uh, an understanding of theory and practice. And I think that that's, that's something that's really kind of added uh, to us just coming in and saying, oh, you need to go make money when you graduate. It's like, well, yeah, we say that. And we like making money. We do make money now. I mean, Johnny oh, yeah. has his consulting business that uh gna media that you've run for over five years i think six seven since 2014 so 24, yeah. six years and then freelance before that but yeah 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 and uh, and you have your newspaper that you run yeah san antonio yeah. sentinel and i have sentinel. yeah my consulting and i have dreamanoids that i run with christian rios and so you know we have this professional background that we do in tandem with teaching um but we do teaching full-time at the same time so it's like we're these kind of like junky entrepreneurs that it's like, <laughs> hey, if, if people are willing to pay us to teach full time and teach people how to do what we love and keep doing what we love, why like not? Yeah, I like that term, junky entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're like, why not? Like, I mean, hey, you know, if there's one thing that entrepreneurs do not benefit from uh, is benefits. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's know? very true. Like, <laughs> yeah. And so having them has been a, a, oh, you know, a huge a huge perk for us. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, and that was really, you know, one of the motivations behind starting the uh, the entrepreneurship course was I was like, I mean, there's, there's so much you can do in the entrepreneurial field right now, right? A and you can be an entrepreneur pretty much at any stage in your life. Like, whether or not you have you have a full time job, you know you can find some space on the on the side and do it. And then we talk about you know the, the the gig economy, gig culture, right? Yeah. And and there's always a space to to make more space, I guess. Well, yeah. And there's you know there's a side hustle. Like one yeah. of the other things that Johnny and I really got into at one point was the semantics, right? And yeah. the lexicon of of entrepreneurship communication, like mm -hmm. you know the terminology that's used, and not. Uh, uh, focusing on the proper terminology, but just saying the terminology. Yeah, acknowledging you know, what, it. Acknowledging it, uh, understanding its positionality. Uh, so when we're talking about a side hustle, like there are people that know what that means and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, an initiative that you're getting after it, you know, one that you're really kind of doing or a social good, you know, understanding yeah. that versus uh, like a social good company versus a nonprofit and, how you can be an entrepreneurial, uh, uh, a nonprofit organizer, uh, or a serial nonprofit <laughs> uh, founder. Yeah. Um, you know, there's all these different spaces that we're trying to uh, show our students, show our colleagues that exist. You know, I, th I when I was unemployed, I helped found two uh, nonprofits, mm -hmm. and I had no um, financial stake in it. I had no I wasn't like, oh, well, let me help you get the grants or I want to be on your board of trustees and get like, you know, some money for this. It's like, no, I literally just wanted to see these nonprofits get started and uh, and and get them taken off. Um, and I knew how to get the paperwork and everything turned in. And that was a, I think that was one of the big things that we've we've had the, the luxury of, like like we were talking about with with Kate Cruz and, and Mary Lynn Ugers is, you know, we had people that would come and speak. Um, and I would learn from them and the students would learn from them. And so whether it was filling out 1099s and learning how to, to do your taxes or learning how to know when to just let go on a project that went awry, you know, like when y'all did a, 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 the Sam Ministries project. Oh, I yeah, was. I remember that. And, and they just wouldn't pay you even mm -hmm. though y'all did the work. And it was like a nonprofit that's really big in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of... There's a few other stories like yeah, that, Yeah, you know, they're, they're <laughs> where you, you, you get burned and you have to learn to let it go. Uh, like, I've had to learn to let customers go sometimes as a, as a uh, hi-fi salesperson of knowing when, when to kind of cut your losses. So, um, so yeah, no, it's, it's... We're in a very, very interesting time. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what you're working on? Yeah. Um, so, currently... Um, as I mentioned, I'm doing the, the, the entrepreneurship and new media course, um, and uh, uh, you know, I guess apart from that, but also kind of like in tandem with that, um, I'm writing a book right now, and it has to do with, with entrepreneurship and new media as well. 
but re really investigating the, the current entrepreneurial landscape and the entrepreneurial space. And um, this is one of the things I talk to my students about is that like you have these two like seemingly conflicting points of view, right? And so I always do juxtapositions in terms of when I assign them readings, right? So I just assign them, uh, I think, chapter, uh, chapter one of Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. Right, well, uh, and, which was like like a seminal entrepreneurial, like very capitalistic text, you know, yeah. uh, a free market economy text. And then you have, and then aside from that, I I, I I kind of assigned them free culture by Professor Lawrence Lessig from Stanford, uh, I guess uh, formerly from Stanford, right? Yeah. Uh, and um, and I assigned them, you know, both these uh, these works, and I'm like, all right. Now, I want you to read both these works, and they're not perfect. There are flaws in both of them, right? Yeah. But but, but I want you to be able to to have the the uh, the confidence to be able to say, well, I agree here, I don't agree here, and this is how I think the entrepreneurial landscape is going to look years from now, um, based on my personal experience, based on wh where I see it going, and and you know, based on these readings, and kind of shape their own unique uh, worldview. Yeah, that was you know that was something I was talking to my students about because their projects are due this week, and uh, you know I told them I said, you know, my goal here isn't for all of y'all to to see that there is a line and uh, what we're going to do is y'all are going to do a project and you're, I draw the line and then you draw the line. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look and see like how well you drew the line compared to what I said you needed to do and, um, and, to, and deduct points off of that. Instead, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, what is a line? Why does it even need to be drawn? Who is it being drawn for? And where is my positionality within the question of this line? Yeah. While they are making practical products, you know, deliverables. They're making video. Well, ultimately, they're all making videos right now because they're, yeah. they're turning it in virtually. But it may be through a podcast. It may be through a narrative film. It may be through... Uh, a blog uh, post with photos and images and video um, or, or graphics, I should say, photos and images, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> graphics and, and photos and, uh, and, and video um, or are literally physically creating something and documenting it with video. Uh, we're asking our students to think beyond their own space in college and critically to think about their agency in this space. Why are you doing this? Why would you make this? What, you know, what are you trying to explore that's going to further your overall goals in life, mm -hmm. whether it's for your career or just something that you're pur purely interested from a theoretical standpoint and you're using college to, to explore that. Yeah. Uh, you know, talking about goals and, and being very goal oriented ourselves, you know, uh, I think that, you know, when I talk to my students, I'm like, I'm like, all right, tell me what, what, you know, what your goals are first, right? What ultimately do you want to get out of it? And I, th I think one of the questions that I ask most of my classes is, um, what do you want to get out of this class? What do you want to get out of college in general, right? And go into it, you know, with that mindset of knowing, I'm, you know, I want to get this out of the, out of it, right? And kind of figuring out what, what that is at first, because then you can figure out where you're going to go from there and, you know, how that's going to work. But I think what you just mentioned, the idea of deconstructing your, your own space and then reconstructing it again, but reconstructing it in a way that's both reflexive, yeah. you know, uh, as, uh, as well as, you know, having the ability to look out and see where you think it's going to be, you know, for everyone else, yeah. where that future is going to be. And I, 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 I'll never forget, like, uh, when Kay came and talked to your class before, uh, before COVID hit, you know, uh, what did he tell them? What he was told, the exact phrase? He, he told them they were generation survival. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then literally like two weeks later, COVID hit and we never went back to class. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty timely. But yeah, I, you know, I, I mentioned, um, you know, their agency because it's just, I need people to understand that we, and myself included, are our biggest barriers. Mm -hmm. So when I give you an assignment in my class, the biggest barrier is your ability to decide to take it on, to take it seriously, to do a good job, 
to uh, do iteration, meaning have like not just do it, but to do it multiple times, just like you would practice painting, practice uh, uh, playing basketball, whatever it is that you, you know, crocheting. I, you know, I use a lot of different examples in my classes to kind of show them like, look, what I'm saying is you have to put the time in. You have to iterate, you know, uh, just like writers or anything. Um, but you are ultimately the judge. Mm -hmm. Your grade in my class is m very much so rooted in your ability to show me that you're having personal growth. Yeah. You know, that you're able to not only... Um, create something but show process and journey through this experience aka learn yeah and that's something i've always liked about you know the, the way the way you teach and and yeah. and, and the uh, the act lab philosophy right that's something i've always liked about that um because and i tell my students i'm like the gatekeepers the historical gatekeepers in the fields of media right in, in, in the media industry they're they're gone now like, I mean, for the most part, like the gatekeepers have disappeared and it, it isn't because they voluntarily gave up their position. It's because the Internet smashed open that door. And now you have the ability to make media and to make these products like years ago. If you if you wanted to start a, 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 a multimedia production company, you would need some serious capital to back that up. But the barrier to entry is so low that uh, with even modest amounts of capital, you can start up a company and you can get off the ground and you can uh, kind of build this this is future for yourself, but you have to, I mean, it's not easy. Like, like the ability to, I mean, yes, the gatekeepers are gone, but the ability to get to that gate, to even begin to assess the fact that I can walk through here and it's okay. And I, and I can go through here and I can, uh, I can actually do what I want to do. To be, to be able to accept that, I mean, you, you put it right, we are sometimes the, the ones who get in the way of, our, of ourselves, right? And being able to, own our, uh, to over overcome our own barriers, our own limitations, uh, that are psychologically imposed is is one of the, the hardest things to do. After you do that, um, it's all just figuring out the you know the the, the tangible things. But it's the intangible things that, that are the hard part. Yeah, because you know one of the things I noticed was that it's just that um, a lot of people that were highly successful uh, in getting good grades in school, um, unbeknownst to themselves were often bored. Yeah. You know, if they were making all A's, it was like, well, uh, yeah, okay, I can do that. I can do that. Okay, I got it all done. Now I'm going to go do what I really want to do. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> yeah. well, if the, <laughs> you know, like, well, what is it that you really want to do? And why aren't you doing that full time? Mm -hmm. Right. And that was kind of one of the things I, I really have run into with students, especially in communications, because it's like the pay isn't great. It's not. It's 30 mm -hmm. 30000 to $100,000 a year is probably the range, which I know that's th more than 3X, okay? But that's just a reality. Um, 3X the pay, and there's time that has to be put into it. You know, there's effort, and and, uh, and there's... For some, it's going to be sacrificed. For other, it's going to be seen as opportunity. Like, uh, you know, full disclosure with Johnny and I, it's like, yeah, we have our base pays that we make. I think the Tribune like outs us on on, yeah. on our pay. It, so it's you can somewhere go online. Look at, yeah, it's probably <laughs> out there somewhere as to what our base pays are. But you know, we have our side hustles. We have yeah. the money that we go and make. So a lot of our colleagues may, um, you know, may not be happy with what they make. But we also, since we're kind of capitalists, uh, you know, we know we're gonna we got to go out and make that extra money if we want it. We can't just stop at at the job that we have. Yeah. You know, we've got to go out and hustle ourselves just like we're telling our students. I can't tell my students, you know, to work hard and hope for the best. It's like work hard and go out there and, and search for opportunity. Definitely. Yeah. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, like you mentioned, like we have our base pay and we do that. But we're out there, you know, we, I mean, you have Dreaminoids, I have GA, uh, yeah. GA Media and the Sentinel. And we're just uh, we have our fingers in multiple cookie jars. Right. But, I mean, I feel like that's going to be kind of the norm in, in, in the future, especially right now. Well, yeah. like, like right now, that I mean, that's becoming the norm. Uh, and that's where it's going. But um, 
being able to tell them that that's okay. And one of the things that I talk about in my book, which is still being written, you know, I, 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 I can't say, I can't say go buy it or anything. It's not, a, it's not a promotional thing. It's still being written. I think I have three chapters done. <laughs> you know, but one of the things I talk about is the sandbox, right? Right. And so like college is, is like their sandbox when yeah. yes, they're going to college and they're doing this, right? But I mean, let's, let's say they're staying at the dorms, right? And, and, and they, and, and they kind of have this set lifestyle. Uh, I told them that at college is the perfect time to go ahead and kind of experiment and, you know, try to create something, uh, be it creatively in the classroom, right, or creatively outside of that. If they want to create an art project or they want to do, so, you know, whatever they want to do or they want to create a, a, a new media enterprise, right? Like I have so many students who are like, I want to start this company, you know, but I'm not sure, like, like if I can, I'm a college student, like, what do I, I mean, I mean, what can I even offer, you know? And Well, I, and, and, and you'll even run into students yeah. that, like, have a business never thought of themselves as an entrepreneur but mm -hmm. when you start talking to them they're like well yeah i like to crochet and i sell my stuff on etsy it's like exactly you're an you're entrepreneur, an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? it's like oh well my parent you know i like to do crafting and i, I have a, a vinyl cutter and stuff yeah i make stickers and sell them <laughs> to all my friends so i'm yeah. like you're an entrepreneur like that's uh, you know, i mean the, the concept yeah. of, a, of a professional and i find and a lot more women so entrepreneurs so far at oh, a m yeah. than than male entrepreneurs uh in my classes and it may be because we have a pretty high percentage of women in our, in our program, but I, I noticed that a lot of them just end up starting to pick up these like side hustles mm -hmm. and then make them in. I mean, well, Claire, you know, who I interviewed yeah. two episodes ago, you know, she was someone that was really into social media. And then, you know, I started, she started messaging me uh, uh, through email asking like, Hey, well, how, how do I approach social media from this way or that way? And then I start, I was like, well, let's zoom. And then I zoomed in and I was like, dude, we got to have a, a podcast about this because yeah. You know, there there are people, young people that have their ear to the ground that are in college that are doing this extra work. And it's not extra credit. Mm -hmm. It's not an honors program. It's not like you get uh, an extra cord when you yeah. graduate. Uh, I guess that's my, my, my working class hater in me. <laughs> You know, that it's like, I'm like, this isn't like some, some extra thing you get when you graduate. It's like, these are just life skills. You yeah. Know? This is you knowing how to handle like, oh shoot, I lost my job. Okay. Well, let's go get my business going. Mm -hmm. Oh shoot. Like, uh, I'm pregnant and, uh, or I, you know, my, my wife or girlfriend is pregnant, you know, and having to deal with that and figuring out, okay, well, how do we get extra income? How do we mm -hmm. make ourselves uh, survive? It's, it's, I, I, it's probably is a, comes from this blue collar background. Uh, my parents were actually white collar, but, but my parents were poor money managers. I mean, I love you parents and y'all are perfectly fine now financially, but, but I definitely grew up with my parents having to consolidate their debt and, um, l l learn how to save themselves. They didn't teach my, my, uh, siblings and I how to save. I literally had to learn to save. That's why Johnny's always like, Joey, why are you telling me to save? I'm like, because dude, like I didn't learn. Even when I was your age, Johnny at 29, I didn't know to save. Like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know to save 2000 to $10,000. I didn't know, like that was unfathomable to me. That didn't make sense. Like it wasn't, it wasn't in my repertoire. And so, um, so it, you know, those are, those are some of those intangibles that I'm trying to, put into our students, even in just our technology classes, because it's mm -hmm. like, if I can teach a student that they can take their phone and start making content and instead of reinvesting it into more equipment, just keep using this mm -hmm. and creating that content and save 10 grand. Can. Yeah. Save two grand to 10 grand and then go buy that equipment. You're going to breathe yeah. because you know what, like you can take some more adventure with what you're trying to create and what you're trying to do because you don't have that fight or flight all of a sudden every yeah. week when a job does or doesn't come through as an entrepreneur. And it's much more leisurely. Yeah. Well, as an entrepreneur, like when I just did GA media, yeah. you know, and, and, and like, you know, that's all I did. And I supported my, my whole lifestyle and my, my, you know, my apartment, everything, right. I supported everything yeah. through just GA media and, you know, uh, it, it, one of the things that I had to learn, albeit reluctantly, <laughs> was, was to save, you know, uh, it, because sometimes you're going to have a bunch of clients coming in yeah. and you're going to be inundated with work and you're going to be like, oh, man, I'm so busy, you know. And the other times you're going to wish you had those clients coming in. You're not going to have anything for a month. And so you, uh, that's why it's important to, to put some in reserve, um, you know, 
uh, and what, you know, back to the iPhone thing, but one, one of the things I always tell my students also, you know, it, it, it is like, you know, because there's such a quandary about students not wanting to call themselves professionals, you know, I'm like, oh, well, what are you doing? Like, well, I've shot wedding videos and I've got paid 500 bucks for it or whatever. And I'm like, oh, really? And like, yeah, but I just use my iPhone. It's not really a professional. I'm like, no, if you got paid to do it, 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 I mean, then you are a professional. Like, there's no one who's going to be like, you know, you're not a professional, you know, because you're getting paid to do it. And I guarantee you there's going to be someone out there with an iPhone X or, or even an iPhone 7 and it's going to be like, hey, I'm a professional. I can do this, uh, you know, and, and they, they, they embrace that title and they're not going to school for it, but they just embrace that title, right? So the, the, the number one thing uh, to, I told them is be ready to embrace that title and accept that when it comes uh, because – if you accept that title and you have the credentials to back it up, which I mean, you're doing right now, right? Yeah. Going through college, you're doing this program. You know, you're, you're just gonna have a leg up. And, but but know that the ultimate, the hardest part, the hardest thing to do is to accept that that yes, you are a professional. Yes, you can do this. That's the hardest part. Um, but moving on from that, I mean, uh, after that, it's all it's all technical, saving money and and you know, finding out where the next paycheck's gonna come from. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and. Uh, and diversifying, you yeah. Know, just diversifying your your talents, your skill set, and uh, and understanding that. I I think you know with the with our approach to teaching, one of the biggest uh, uh, intangibles is just knowing that you don't have to know. Yeah, and it's okay. And that you're gonna ask for help, you're gonna learn from other people, and you're gonna seek that knowledge out. And that you know it's the network that you build around yourself that is actually a big tool, like probably one of the most expensive tools that you have because of social and cultural outlay mm -hmm. you know you, you have to build and foster relationships and uh and you'll see that your your network will end up having a huge uh, monetary value to it as well yeah. and how you treat others and how you uh interact with those uh, uh that are above you in the journey and below you in the journey you know it it, it all plays a big role that's why i think yeah. another reason why i think we i take you know, listening to my students, so so to heart. And you know, uh, I think you know, I mean, we we have some amazing students here at A and M, as well as amazing and supportive faculty and staff. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it's just a great community to be a part of. And you know, I guess perhaps I'm a little bit biased because I've always been a huge A and M fan. You know, and and, and I've always loved the the culture here at A and M. But I mean, actually coming here and seeing how receptive they are to you know to what we're bringing to the table and to, to what we're trying to do and supportive, and that's that's, that's very very, you know, uh, very, uh, I guess, heartening, right? So yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, because, yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> I went to UT. I got my BS, my MA, my PhD at, like, you know, back when we used to have a rivalry. Um, but uh, We'll play again one day. <laughs> but I just, I when I got here, like Johnny says, I just couldn't believe uh, the student population here is, mm -hmm. is really not what I thought it was going to be. Um, People are all over the spectrum politically. Um, people genuinely want to help each other out just because they're Aggies, mm -hmm. uh, and so that that has that actually has played into the strength of what we do in our pedagogical approach because um, it's it doesn't it doesn't sound hippy dippy. It's just well, of course we all help each other out, and of yeah. course that's like the Texas way, and you know that's yeah. the Aggie way is that uh, Aggie helps each other and. You know, they, they have the this uh, Aggie code of honor. Mm -hmm. uh, an Aggie doesn't lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say, having been uh, uh, like an Eagle Scout, or being an Eagle Scout, and having come from some conservative spaces, uh, and then adopting this, like, huge hippie background uh, as I went to college at UT, you know, I I do value that that statement because... It does, to an extent, um, kind of just put the people that are in front of us, you know, our students that are in front of us, have like at least some kind of understanding of what, you know, what we're going to expect because we're looking for genuine engagement. Yeah. Now, I'm looking for people that are going to be honest uh, and not just honest as in to tell me that they like me. That's not honest, you know, but to tell me what they think. And uh, so when we say uh, an Aggie doesn't lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do, what, I, what, I'm, what excites me about that statement is not the conservative side as much as the idea that we're going to have people that are super authentic, are trying to be as authentic as possible, 
with what they're doing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, and I think you know, the, the students really take that to heart. You know, they really do. Uh, and, and being able to work with them and like, uh, I mean, this is also, you know, one of the most motivated like student bodies I've seen. You know, I mean, they're very motivated and they're willing to, to put in the, the work and the effort. And that's very good, you know, and, and I really appreciate seeing that. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, Nagy doesn't lie, cheaters still will tolerate those who do. And they take that seriously, like, yeah, like yeah. very, very seriously, you know. And, I mean, uh, I came from a family of, of Aggies, so, so I've mm -hmm. always known that's like, uh, like gr growing up or whatever. My dad's always like, remember, an Aggie doesn't lie, cheaters still <laughs> or tolerate those who do. And I'm like, that's right. And then I'll look over at my little Miss Reveille, you know, plush when I, when I was a kid, and I'm like, she's always watching. <laughs> I would say I haven't found any better students than, than A&M, but I also taught at UT, so <laughs> we'll put them on equal grounding for right now. It's like, it's like well, you know, I mean, there's UIW, too. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever. Those students were horrible. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> look, at, look at what they created. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, other than us just kind of uh, uh, playing, paying p pleasantries to people that we've taught, mm -hmm. I guess what we're really saying is, is that w we enjoy having a community that creates positive outcomes and positivity in general and that's something that we're definitely looking to build as what no matter where we are i mean yes mm -hmm. we love being at a m but we also understand a m is uh i mean it's a machine just like any other institution and as much as we think they love us i mean it's a machine and the machine will hug us but you know it's still <laughs> a machine um and uh and that said, it's like we're, we're always trying to bring this anywhere. And that's how we were able to bring it from UIW yeah. to uh, A&M is that like we realize that these are institutions, but the idea is to create that network that mm -hmm. goes beyond. And um, and so I don't know. I, I, I really look forward to seeing uh, what this year brings. Like I would love to check back in in a year with you, yeah, see, uh, see where the book's at see how we were able to navigate COVID and build community. That's going to be mm -hmm. one of our biggest challenges is like, not only how do we maintain community, but how do we build a bigger community while COVID is occurring? And <laughs> the real hard part, how do we create job opportunity, you know, as professors uh, for people during COVID and, and job avenues and, and really seek that out? You know, yeah. I think that's something that, uh, we've in the past, we worked with the Alliance for Women in Media in San Antonio. It's like, I really want to talk to the Alliance for Women in Media in Austin, San Antonio, Houston, get them over here, mm -hmm. uh, I guess through Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably for right and, now. Yeah. For right now. Well, that, but that's what I mean. Yeah, like in yeah. this time, at, like, at this moment, like, yeah. we're having to save for right now, but this is right now. Yeah. You know, we're having, you know, uh, students that are graduating and can go look for a job. Like how, how do we bring the market here? Mm-hmm. You know, how do we bring them to the market and, and get them employed? Yeah. And uh, not that it's all on us, because we have a lot of great colleagues that have connections and and find students jobs. But we want to we want to be a, a participatory in that, too. And we want to bring that to our department. So. Yeah, definitely. Well, so Johnny, cool. thank you so much for being on the podcast. I have to teach at one thirty. It's a uh, one seventeen. Oh, Got to get my Zoom going. It's coming up. You have anything you want to plug or talk about? Not. Nah, that's about it. I think we've hit all the points. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's been great being on the podcast again. I've really enjoyed watching where the podcast, you know, has come and and, and seeing all your episodes and who you've had on there. Uh, so happy to be back here and looking forward to checking in another year or so. You, you want to plug the biggest project in, on earth? What's uh, the, our, our 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 project? Our biggest initiative that we currently have. Oh oh the uh, uh, with the uh, adventures adventures with Joey and Johnny barbecue. Yeah, oh, we have yeah, our own YouTube that. Yeah, yeah. channel. We have our own YouTube channel. Be sure and check it out. Adventures with Joey and Johnny. More episodes coming soon. Coming soon. <laughs> yeah, there's a big asterisk right now because uh, we have shot. I what, think we're up seven? to like six or seven <laughs> episodes. Johnny has edited one and we one released it and it's done very well. We'll put a link to it in the, in the bottom in our description, but Check out uh, our barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for whatever reason, during COVID, since we've been hanging out, um, we started barbecuing, uh, heavily and it got to the point now where, uh, we've barbecued in a different couple of different locations and definitely mm -hmm. uh, a lot of different styles. Yeah. And so, um, like last night we made uh, a rack of spare ribs that were just, Oh, that was amazing. Yeah. They were, they were, 
They were impressive. They were from the AM Rosenthal meat Yeah, Center. we have like, yeah, we're going to do a whole episode on how like we get our meat from AM, which is totally like a Texas thing. I mean, I, you can't get more Texas than buying uh, uh, your food from the place uh, at which you work. Yeah. That is also a huge cultural symbol, at least for Johnny and, and his lifestyle. <laughs> Me, not so much. Uh, I, my brother in law came and got some meat and, oh, and it was man. kind of sacrilegious because it was really funny to me is that, you know, we went and bought the meat. He was really excited. He went to, to, uh, uh, the University of Utah. So no, no, no alliance here, but <laughs> my sister got her farm D, uh, uh, U, yeah, UT. And so, you know, they get all this meat. It comes in like this A&M box and my, uh, brother-in-law opens the box up when we get to the truck and just, you know, puts all the ice in his UT cooler and then puts all the meat in the UT cooler. And I'm just like, man, this is, I don't know. Hopefully you'll get out of here safely. I felt like a burning <laughs> sensation inside. I don't know what it was. I was, I was like, oh, I don't know. This doesn't feel right. I, I, feel, I feel tainted. <laughs> so anyways, we hope you enjoyed uh, this podcast. We will be back. I've got a lot more people in line. I've already lined up. Um, is it not this week's, not the, not this coming weeks, but the following weeks uh, uh, person that I'm going to interview. And I'm lining one up uh, currently for next week as well. So it should be a lot of fun. I hope y'all are having a great day. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see y'all later. See y'all.